Hello and welcome to the second video in this series focusing on the music of Hugo Thier. I'm James Holland and for today's video we'll go into the details of his life with a few pieces of music along the way. Vigotier was born in the then province of Dauphiné, near Vienne, around 1575. At the age of seven, he was placed in the service of the Dame de Montmorency, the wife of Henry I, Duke de Montmorency, Gouverneur de Pays de Languedoc. It was in this household that he began his training as a lutenist. The lute he would have learnt on would have been tuned in Renaissance tuning or Vieton, as it was to be later known in the 17th century most likely a six, seven or eight course instrument. It was during Gautier's time at the Montmorency household that Marie de Médicis, the second wife of the French king Henry IV, took interest in his lute playing. The first proof we have of Gautier being at court is in 1613 from a letter written by the French poet François de Malherbe, who lived at court, in a correspondence with Peresque in which he speaks of a musician named Gautier who is a musician of the highest order. It was during this time that Marie de Médicis was in the role of Queen Regent as Henry IV had been assassinated in 1610 and Louis XIII, being born in 1601, was too young to yet rule as king. Some other lute players we know of working at court around this time were Robert Ballard, lute teacher to Louis XIII, and René Mésinjou for whom Gautier composed a beautiful tombeau after his death in 1638. It is one of the first instrumental tombeau written and the beginning of a long tradition of this kind of work. Mesangeau was widely regarded as an important lutenist in early 17th century France and one of the pioneers experimenting with new ways to tune the lute, known as Les Accords Nouveaux, which started around 1620. We have a few books printed by the lutenist Robert Ballard's brother, Pierre Ballard, showing the development of these tunings in France. Firstly, in 1623, the Tablature de Lutte de Différents Auteurs sur l'Accord Ordinaire et Extraordinaire, meaning the Renaissance tuning, the Vieton, and new tunings. This was followed by the 1631 and 1638 books, both entitled Tablature de Lutte de Différents Auteurs sur les Accords Nouveaux. It is only in the 1638 book that we come across the D minor tuning, or Baroque lute tuning that was to become so popular in France and later in Germany. So for all this time, up until 1638, in Montgoutier must have been composing in the old Renaissance tuning, or experimenting with Les Accords Nouveaux in his 40s. He probably would have been around 50 years old when he first started using the D minor tuning, and today all the music we have, that we are sure is by him, is in this tuning, and is to be found in manuscripts and prints dating from the second half of the 17th century onwards. As I mentioned in the first video in this series, there were a few other lutenists named Gautier. And we do have some pieces written in Vuitton and Les Accords Nouveaux attributed to Gautier, but it is difficult to be sure which of these were composed by Edmond Gautier. Perhaps he wasn't yet old enough or, or skilled enough during this period to have acquired the nickname Vieux-Gautier. This is by far the most common name we find in both the Livre de Tablature, printed by his cousin Denis Gautier, and in many of the manuscripts in which his works may be found, such as this Chacon from the Cesne manuscript. <laughs> widely revered in France. In 1636, 
Mersenne writes that it is difficult to touch the lute so perfectly as the sirs Lanclou and Gautier. If we are to believe the account of Dalmont de Rio, this duo once spent 36 hours playing together without eating or drinking. Around 40 years after his death, René Milleron cites him as one of the greatest lute masters. Still much later on in 1732, Titon Dutier writes that he was an excellent lute player and had many students, some from the higher nobility who became enamoured with the lute and were very fond of their teacher. The likes of Marie de Médicis and the Cardinal Richelieu. He goes on to say that the Gautiers, both Denis and Edmond, had some very good students, such as Gallo, Dufault, Mouton, and others. Gallo tells us, in his introduction to his Pièce de Lutte from around 1670, that when people accuse me of pillaging from Vieux Gautier, nothing could bring more honour to my work. It pleases me to see that they recognise the principles which he taught me and to which I adhere to. For those that distance themselves from these principles fall into bad taste, both in composition and in execution. It wasn't only in France that Vigotier was admired, but also in England. In Mary Burrell's Lute Tutor from the 1660s, we find a wonderfully colourful praising of Gautier. Laurencini, Perrichon and the Pollack are the furthest lutenists in the memory of man that deserve to be mentioned and to have a statue upon the Mount of Parnassus for having given us the rudiments of the lute and cleared the first difficulties that hindered production of this masterpiece. Afterwards, Monsieur Mesanjou appeared upon the stage of music and, using his lute with nineteen strings, had so polished the composition and the playing of it that, without contradiction, we must give him the praise to have given the lute its first perfection. The clouds of ignorance having been so dissipated by this worthy son of Apollo, many musical lights have risen in France, among whom a single one as the sun among the stars hath drawn the admiration and the praises of all the world. It is the first Gautier who is named in regard to his age and merit, old Gautier, to which fortune, not so deaf as blind, hearkened and, through the liberality of kings, queens and other princes, crowned with honour and fulfilled with riches. The old Gautier was sent to England by his good mistress, the Queen Marie de Médicis, to testify to the King and Queen the joy that she took for the birth of the Prince of Wales, Charles II, now King of England. He played of the lute before the King and Queen. Their Majesties made him presents both worthy of kings and of the King of the lute. And the late Duke of Buckingham, before whom he played also, in embracing of him, made slide in his pocket five hundred pounds of gold to stop him, as Atalanta did her sweetheart with the golden apples, some few days longer in the court of England with this precious burden. when the Queen Mother was exiled for good after putting a little too much faith in a son's unconditional love and demanding Louis XIII 
to choose between the Cardinal de Richelieu and herself. Vuotier's career at court was over, and he returned to his native Dauphiné. Firstly, he stayed with his brother and was given a servant, a certain Benoit Cousin, the daughter of a poor peasant who lived from day to day, who then became his mistress. After a few years, Enemont moved into the Chateau de Neve, where his servant mistress kept him busy while she had her way with Master Pierre Colombe, a prosecutor in Vienne, a supposed friend of Vugotier. With help from Colombe, Cousin did everything to ensure her inheritance of Vuotier's estate. However, at the beginning of 1650, the old Enimon seemed to want to defend the rights of his family and came to Paris on the 3rd of March to give a donation to his brother and niece. But on the 8th of August the following year, there was another donation, this time in favour of Benoit Cousin, of the possession of all the furniture of his Chateau de Neve and of 9,000 livres. Although, even this could not satisfy her greed. On December the 11th, 1651, Enemont Gautier made his last will, by which he instructed Master Pierre Colombe to transmit his inheritance to his servant. Six days later, Vuotier married Benoit Cousin and died the very same day. His family protested against her marriage to a corpse and demanded the marriage and Gautier's last will and testament to be declared null and void, and for his estate to go to them. Although, in the end, the Parliament of Grenoble gave its judgment in favour of Benoit Cousin, who kept it all. So take what morals you will from this story depicting the end of Vuotier's life, Personally, it strikes me that certain aspects of humanity haven't changed all that much since 17th century France. Sorry if that thought depresses you. I'll try my best to reboost your morale with this wonderful Canarie en Ré mineur de Vigotier. Mm -hmm.